Hey guys, welcome back to Home Built, and this week we're continuing to work on the HVAC system on the Alferrari. All right, so those of you who were watching last week will have seen me make this really odd looking contraption, which is the heater for this car and the diverter valve to select whether we want the, uh, the hot air to go onto the screen or down onto your feet. Um, for those of you who missed it, I'll put a link um, up above so you can catch up. And um, if you haven't subscribed, please think about subscribing. It does help uh, just clicking that little button. <laughs> does make a difference. All right. Um, now, uh, a couple of things I mentioned last week that um, was that I was going to make up some more ducts to actually uh, match up with the factory unit. So basically the, uh, the defrost vents, which go in the top of the dash, um, this is the original defrosting uh, sort of connection vent. And then there's a, uh, a little retaining ring that clips on top of that. And I spent a bit of time during the week um, designing up these things. So this is um, something I designed up on um, Fusion 360 and uh, put on my 3D printer and printed out. I am absolutely amazed at how good and simple 3D printers are these days to just sort of design something. This probably took me an hour to design um, because I'm not very good on Fusion 360. I'm, I'm a complete noob at this stuff. But I always thought it would be so complicated. It's just too complicated, it's too hard, it takes too long to design something, and it's really not the case. So um, I also spent a bit of time going through and designing up. I did a sort of little test print of um, the space I have to make a vent for the feet for the driver's floor, um, meeting up with my 42 mil ducting that I've ordered. I've ordered some new ducting hose, so that's coming. Um, that was a test print. Um, I decided I actually needed a longer vent and I've actually made a smaller one for the passenger side because there is a longer length of hose, I needed more of a restriction. So um, I'll test them out, uh, but it's easy enough. These things took me about five minutes to design, 10 minutes to design maybe, and um, then set the 3D printer going and it's a couple of hours. I'll give you a very quick look now at how simple it is to design a basic vent. All right, so this is the 3D program I use called Fusion 360. It's a free program and uh, we'll just uh, go through quickly how to do a basic design. So first of all, I pick the surface I'm going to start on, which is the base here, and uh, I'm going to draw a rectangle. I'm just going to make this one a center rectangle. So pick the center, drag it out, and then put in my dimensions, which in this case I want to be 65 millimeters by 16 millimeters, which is the, the size of the center of the duct. And then I'm going to add a circle on either end at 16 millimeters as well. So just drag it out 16 millimeters, and then select another circle and drag that out 16 millimeters. And there's my basic duct shape. So I'm going to select all of the internal parts of this all together and then drag them out uh, using the extrude function, which just turns it into a 3D form. And I want that 20 millimeters. So as you can see, there's probably quicker ways to do this, but this is the way I do it. But uh, moving forward, I'm going to select the top here and then construct a plane 40 millimeters above that, which is where the start of my sort of duct shape is going to be. So you'll see this in a second, but I've got another plane here. So I'm going to start drawing on this other plane and I'm going to draw the shape and the size of my duct, which is 42 millimeters. So I put that as 42 millimeters. There's my duct, select the center again and extrude it again. And I want it 25 millimeters deep. And there's the top and the bottom of my duct. And then to join them together, I just select the base of that piece and the top of the other piece and go up and use the loft command and it joins the two together. And there's the basic shape of my duct. It's that quick and easy. This is all real time. This is exactly what it took me to do it. 
So um, you can see the shape there, and uh, obviously it's now a solid part, which is not what we want, so we want to make it hollow. So I'm going to select the shell command, and select the top and the bottom, and I want it one and a half millimeters thick, and there you go. It's hollowed it out, and we have a completed duct. It's literally that quick and easy to design something. I was amazed at how quick and easy it really is to do some of this you know, 3D design stuff. You don't need to be a rocket scientist to make this stuff. So now what we're going to do is we're going to 3D print it. So I'm going to um, select the thing I'm going to print, and uh, and then it's going to go to Cura, which is uh, the 3D printing software. So basically what this does is it takes that shape and then it makes it into um, a bunch of layers and lines and basically gives it the commands that the 3D printer needs to actually print it out. And um, you can see here um, I slice it and these are the sort of settings I'm using on my 3D printer for those who are interested printing in ABS. Um, I said I am not an expert but uh, this seems to work for me and uh, that's all there and we just press slice and this will turn that image into something that's 3D printable. And that is it. It is really that easy. Then you just take this image, save it to a disk, and put it in the 3D printer and press print, walk away, come back in a couple of hours, and you've got your print. As you can see here, it's going to take three hours and nine minutes, which sounds like a lot, but as I said, you just press print and walk away and come back. Put it, set it going overnight. The 3D printer I have, which is an end of five, it's not... It's not loud and um, it just sits in a room by itself and just prints away and then I come back in the morning and get my completed piece. So as I said, the, the, the sheer fact that you can just draw something up on the computer and, and then print and have a physical useful part at accurate dimensions is just absolutely mind-blowing how quick and simple it is. These things were all printed out in ABS. Um, it should be uh, good enough to handle the temperature inside the car. There are probably better things to do. The balances are with the different materials which I'm learning is um, PLA is a very easy thing to print. It print it's, but it prints at a lower temperature so it would probably warp on the car uh, in the heat. Whereas um, this requires a lot more heat, but when a printing, often you can get uh, more warping and, and things like that, and it doesn't, they don't turn out as well. But these ones turned out really good, and I am happy. So, um, yes, I'm keen to play around with a 3D printer more, and the more I find little bits and pieces that I need to design and build, the more I'm going to use it. Moving on. Um, I have here my heater valve. Now, one thing that I wasn't really happy about um, as I was making it, but I sort of just um, thought I'd get it, get it done to this level first, uh, is that these two fans on this end are sort of pretty much blocked. I mean, there is, there is an air gap in there, but it's not a very good ducted uh, space to send the, uh, the air out. Uh, so I'm just going to just uh, put another shape on the top here. I'll just do a quick little bit of CAD and uh, and hopefully we can make the uh, the ducting a little bit more efficient than what it currently is. All right, I'm much happier with that. Um, yeah, a little bit of work to make a, a, a duct to uh, sort of direct the air flow a little bit better up towards these outlets. Um, I also tapered at the back so that when the valve is one way or the other, it's still completely blocking off the airflow because obviously if I open this all up, then it would slip past the edge of the valve and make it completely useless. So I think that is much better. So I think that is done and it means it's time to move on to something else. Okay, so I've got the internal parts of my air conditioning and my heater systems in the car, but uh, particularly with the air conditioning, that is not all that's required. Obviously, there is the internal part, but then we've also going to have to have a air conditioning condenser. And uh, what I want to look at at the moment is the compressor. So 
Basically, this is a uh, this is the electric unit for the uh, classic retrofit aircon system that I'm going to be fitting in Harry. The uh, it's a very well sorted system, and uh, um, yeah, this is obviously what you need to run it if you're going to run it straight off of uh, electric power. Obviously, most cars usually run it off of a belt drive off of the uh, off of the engine, but there is no way to fit that in this car. Um, that's what the Ferrari originally had. So I thought about doing an electric system. And I thought I was being very smart and saving myself a bit of cash. And I did a bit of research on what cars have electric compressors. And the Tesla obviously is something that comes straight to mind. Uh, their compressors secondhand, obviously because they're Tesla, they're relatively expensive. But I did some more research on other cars that would use electric compressors. And I found that the Toyota Prius had uh, electric compressors, but also the hybrid Camry. And the hybrid Camry seemed to be very cheap, and I got myself a electric compressor out of a hybrid Camry. I thought I was being really smart, and then I was mentioning this to uh, Benny's Cousins of Works, Benny, and uh, he brought it to my attention that these are high voltage units. So these, I think they run on 100 plus volts. Uh, in the, uh, in the Camry, so I don't think I can straight wire this up, but this is where I wanna ask you guys. Uh, I can go and buy another one of these, uh, the, the 12 volt units, but is there a way I can get this to run on 12 volts relatively simply, or is it gonna be just easier to get the other one? That is something I don't know, so uh, I'm gonna leave it up to you guys to, uh, to let me know what the uh, the way to go is. Um, I said I can I can buy the other one, but obviously there, I already have this, and um, it's obviously more money that uh, I can't put into this elsewhere. So let me know in the comments. Uh, but I am going to be mounting the compressor, whichever one it is, in the boot of the car, and uh, then I've got to try and work out where I'm going to put a condenser. Okay, so for the air conditioning condenser, I was looking around for different options, and that's when I remembered that I actually have this car, which for those of you who don't know, this is the Rockster, this is Australia's ugliest uh, <laughs> Porsche, and uh, it's uh, another one of my projects, so I'll put a link up above if you haven't uh, seen this project before, but uh, basically this is being built into a V8 track car, and I am not going to be needing air conditioning in this car, so this has condensers, and I am, uh, I believe that the condensers are actually quite a good compact size in this car, which is gonna be handy for the uh, uh, the Alfa Ferrari because we don't have much space. So what I think I'm gonna do now is I'm going to pull the, uh, the front end off and see if we can get out a condenser and um, see if it will fit into the Alfa Ferrari. All right, and we have a nice compact air conditioning condenser. Now, uh, the Boxer does run two of these, whereas uh, I'm probably gonna run the one because I don't have that much space. Two is gonna be more efficient and going to work better, but um, we can work out whether this is gonna do enough or not, and uh, I can potentially try and find a way to put another one in at a later date, but at least we will get aircon working with this little unit. So uh, let's see if we can find somewhere to put this thing in the car. All right, so I've been going around the car trying to find places to fit this condenser. It's not going to fit in the front here because once I've got the oil cooler in there, there is just not enough room. So uh, I went around and underneath the car, I could potentially sort of sit it flat up under here, but I'm worried it'd be very vulnerable to rocks and stuff like that. Um, so there's no room there. So the place I have the most space is under the back of the car. And the issue is, is that there is nowhere under here with a diff that can, is gonna go up and down and stuff that I can fit it up underneath near the axle. And at the back here, it is all open, but of course I've got two mufflers to go in. So the only place it's gonna be suitable, I think, is on an angle off to the side here. Now there's gonna be a muffler running through the middle through here, but with this um, condenser over here, I can put a, 
a puller fan, so it's going to take air from the top and suck it through. So it will get air through, flow through from uh, in front of the wheel arch there and also from in behind here. And uh, then uh, I can have a shield that I can build in front of the exhaust, just to, a heat shield to stop it from getting too hot there. I think that is the perfect place. So I think now I need to build some mounts to mount this into that corner of the car. So uh, as you can see here, I've made up three different mounts for the, uh, the condenser to go in the back of the car. Just folded them up. I've punched a couple of holes into uh, each of them so that I can plug weld them on there. So now it's time to get under there, line it all up and uh, weld it all into place. I'm very happy with that. I've got my mounts in there and my condenser is all mounted up. It's as out of the way as it can possibly be. You can see that there's plenty of room for air to get in uh, and around that won't necessarily go past the exhaust. So uh, I am quite happy with that. All right, so moving on. Uh, as you may have seen, when I fit the air conditioning system into this car, I actually cut off the scuttle drain. So what that is, is where the air comes into the cabin. And obviously that area um, lets air in. It's got a, a, a shield to stop any water getting into the car. So the air has to go down and up and into the car. But there is going to be water that gets into this area and that drains out um, usually through an ugly hose that comes through the cabin, through the engine bay and just dumps out onto the ground. And I cut off the drain, which is on the right hand side of this sort of scuttle area because this car is originally designed as a left hand drive car and they made it in left hand, right hand drive versions, but in the, they kept the, uh, the scuttle drain in the same spot. But generally, like I mentioned earlier, the, uh, the roads in Australia being uh, a right hand drive country, you're generally leaning towards the left. So I'm gonna move my scuttle drain over onto the left-hand side. So um, that's what I'm gonna do now. So let's get over there and see how I'm gonna do that. Okay, so I've got this uh, Raceworks, uh, it's a Dash 10 mild steel weld on fitting that uh, I'm going to obviously weld to the scuttle, but I don't want this lip on the edge here because I want to be able to make sure that the water drains and nothing sits and pulls around the edge. So if I just did a hole and welded it in, the potential for water to just sit around the edge and eventually rust it out would be high, which is why you saw me just go through then and, um, and use the, um, the, the dimple die tool to, to put a dimple in it and then also sort of hammer it down and, and actually get some, some shape in the scuttle so that all the water will drain out that, that spot. And I'm just gonna put this fitting on the lathe now and I'm just gonna turn a taper into the end of it just so that it's, uh, when I weld it on, it's just gonna taper in and, uh, and flow all the water hopefully through and out of the scuttle. All right, that is looking much better now. I've got a nice taper in the, uh, in the end, so I can weld that on and make sure that the water is not going to pull 
Uh, so let's get in there, weld it on, and uh, have a new drain, at least the top part, done. So you can see in here with the fitting on, it is super tight. So I think I'm gonna have to actually put a, a hose onto the end of that uh, fitting and see if we actually have enough space to get it out and uh, drain that scuttle. So I had a look under the car and trying to find a way to exit this tube. So we've got the drain tube here and we need to exit it out, and I'm gonna exit it out somewhere in the tunnel here. Any water will sort of pull down next to the gearbox, might go over the edge of the gearbox and just end up on the ground. Uh, the exhaust runs under here, uh, under this sort of section here, so you shouldn't hit the exhaust. Let's go underneath and I'll show you what I mean. So you can see up under here, we're up under the car next to the uh, the gearbox here, and you can see the, these self-tappers are coming through. That's where my removable panel on my tunnel is. They're gonna be replaced with captive nuts, of course. And uh, I'm gonna make the, the exit just up here somewhere. Um, so basically the water, the, uh, the, the tube will come down through here and sort of drain out on the ground. All right, so we have our two drains now. We have the uh, the top drain is actually coming out of the aircon unit. Um, I'll have to work on the hose. That hose is uh, kinking. I might actually uh, swap it. That was the hose that came with it. Might use some Raceworks hose, uh, which will be better. And this is the scuttle drain, which will go down through like that with a bushing. Obviously, there's gonna be rubber bushings on both of them. So we have our drains all sorted. We have our scuttle drain in. Um, I have to weld it all up properly when I get a car on the rotisserie because it's too hard to weld upside down. I keep blowing holes. But our HVAC system is looking pretty good. All right, so the last thing I think I'm gonna tackle for today is this is the boot release for the Alpha. So um, standard, this car, as I said, originally was designed as a left-hand drive car, and then they made it in right-hand drive for right-hand drive markets. But they kept the boot release on the passenger side of this car. So um, while I'm here and in the bare metal, it's easy enough to swap this over and put it on the other side, which means um, this is actually just, I'll have to get a new one of these if they're available. Um, but the, uh, the, this whole release section here, I think I'm gonna cut it out and weld it in on the other side and uh, we'll patch this up. So start cutting. And there we are, we're all done. It's all mounted in nicely. So now we need to go over to the other side and uh, fill in the hole. And there we go, all patched up, all looking nice and neat and tidy. Okay, and there's another bunch of jobs marked off the list. Um, we are getting closer and closer every day. I know I keep saying that, but uh, we really are. It's, um, yeah, it's, it's getting down to the fine end. Please let me know about that compressor, if I can actually get that high voltage compressor to work, or, uh, or if I definitely can't, or it's just not that easy. Um, it's definitely, above my pay grade, uh, knowing those sort of electrical things. I am just, uh, yeah, I can connect this wire to that wire, but that's about it.
Anyway, that's about all the time I have this week, so I think that means it's time for Fun Facts with Mrs. Jeff. Hey guys, in 1954, Ferrari released its first real Grand Tourer, the 250 Europa GT. Up to this point, Ferrari sold semi-race models that could be driven on the road, but were not really practical for their elite clientele to drive every day. The 250 Europa was the start of the true road car trend for Ferrari. As with all of the 250s, it was powered by a 3-litre Colombo V12 and had an emphasis on comfort and adequate luggage space. The production of the 250 GT was a major turning point for Ferrari as they realized that having a uniform product that was standardized meant increased profitability and ease of production. They expanded the factory and turned out a lot more cars for their customers and they also started to use Pininfarina as their coach builder exclusively. This historic collaboration was famously agreed upon in a restaurant in 1951 by Enzo and Battista Farina and remained a fruitful collaboration for many decades of Ferrari cars. Yeah. Well, we're, uh, we're getting there. Uh, hopefully some of you got some of that stuff on the 3D printing and stuff. Uh, I'm still amazed that I can <laughs> just, just design something up and print it out, just hit print and come back. It takes a few hours, but come back a few hours later and there's, there's a thing that's accurate that I can actually use. Um, it's, yeah, it's... Life-changing, yeah. exciting, very exciting. It is. Yeah. And, and these 3D printers, and I'll put a link to it in the description, but like yeah. it's, it's quite an, a you know, reasonably affordable thing that you can actually, actually use. I'm quite happy. But just make sure your cats don't sit on it because that does yeah. not help. <laughs> yeah. I've lost a couple of prints to cats. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> anyway. <laughs> anyway, please like and subscribe. Um, and if you want to follow Jeff a day early and let him... Look well, towards that hairdressing fund that he needs to get. Um, yeah. <laughs> do you want to thank you on and you'll get to see the videos of that ads. Yeah, all right, guys. See Bye. you next time. Hi, guys. <laughs> it's been a long day. <laughs> First real Grand Tour, Tourer, with the 250 Euro G. Uh, released this. First real Grand Tour, Tourer. Emphasis on adequate luggage space. Splice. Splice. <laughs> As of all the, blah, blah, blah. and as always with an emphasis on adequate. No, not as always. Shut up. Oh my God, there's all these bugs. All these bugs.